Pastor Mark, welcome back. Uh, we previously did a recording with you, and uh, welcome back. Thanks to you. It's it's really a delight, and it's an honor to be here. In our previous conversation, we 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 tussled with the idea that we should definitely look at biblical discernment right. uh, as a topic of discussion. And um, we live in a context in Africa where there's a lot of churches, unfortunately, in a lot of these churches there's uh, some form of weirdness. Uh, and, uh, you know, I dearly believe that the topic of discussion today specifically um, will help people and give them an indication as to how they can be balanced in right. their life. Um, and maybe we should start there. Uh, how will you define balance? You know, balance is, is something very uh, needed, I, not, not just in Africa, I think in Everywhere. the whole world. Yeah. And uh, I, I'll, I'll never forget that I was teaching on balance the one day, and uh, I asked the audience the question, what is balance? <laughs> and the one guy came to me and he says, well, I don't know what balance is, but I know what a balanced diet is. So I said to him, okay, what is that? He says, it's a Big Mac in each hand. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think some people have a warped idea of what balance is. Mm. Because for me, balance is not to have an equal amount of good and evil and balancing it out. Balance is to have good, 100% pure. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes also I think people have this idea that balance is the center point between what is, uh, what is bad, what is error, mm. and what is mm. truth. It, it, it's not. Balance, that center point, is actually the balance between two truths. Yeah, for sure. Not the truth and the lie. Mm, mm. And, and, and what I love about the Bible is the Bible always puts two truths in tension, not opposite truths, parallel truths, but the Bible gives us the boundaries. Mm. And, and I absolutely love that. I'll, I'll never forget, I, um, I was driving in the free state one day and I saw this beautiful scene with the windmill and, and the, uh, the farm dam and so on. And I wanted to take a picture of it. And as I got out the car, and I walked towards this farm gate because I wanted to have the gate in the foreground. I saw that there was a railway line. And as the free state, you don't have a train there <laughs> every hour. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I looked to the side and I just saw this beautiful railway picture. And when I took the picture and la later on looked at it, I saw, wow, it actually looks like the two tracks are converging at on the horizon. And, and I, I thought that is such a beautiful picture. The two truths that the Bible would keep in tension never cross, mm. but they do converge. Yeah, sure. And I like what Spurgeon said. Spurgeon speaks about this, and I'm going to quote him freely. He speaks about the fact that sometimes we see these two truths, and we, in fact, he, he speaks about um, a God's sovereignty and man's free will. Mm. And I know that's sometimes something we battle with, you know, because you get the Armenianists and you get the Calvinists and, and sometimes we just cannot get these things together. And he makes this statement and he says, it looks like they never come together, but somewhere close to the throne of God, They'll they meet. And, and I think if we can just make sure that we don't get out of sync and that we don't get imbalanced on one side or on the other side become extreme, then I think that's what the Bible wants us to do, is to find that spiritual balance. So here's what I always uh, encourage people to do. If you discover some truth in the Bible, go and look for the other parallel truth that would keep it in intention. Let me use uh, a, a one example here. We know that Jesus gave us authority. Mm. He says, I give you authority uh, over demons, etc., etc. So we have spiritual authority. That's a biblical truth. There is a parallel truth called humility. Mm. Now, if we oversize authority, we'll get arrogant. Yeah. 
There's a superiority. Right. There's the false superiority. Yeah. If we overemphasize humility, we get inferiority. Yeah, for sure. And that is why we need to always find that balance between the two. Because here's, here's the balance, how God sees me. God sees me as his child. God sees me as uh, somebody who is anointed with authority. But also, I need to realize that my strength comes from God. Mm. And, and, and that's just one, one concept of, of balance and, and those two truths. Yeah, and, and, and also, you, I think at Pastor have spoken about um, deliverance and right. discipline. Maybe you want to speak. <laughs> right. That. That's a, an, another beautiful uh, a picture of balance. And I think in our circles, if I can talk about the Pentecostal yeah. charismatic constituency, <laughs> there's sometimes for me an overemphasis on deliverance from mm. demons. Uh, in other circles, there might be nothing. Uh, <laughs> they totally ignore Absolutely. deliverance and they only speak about disciplining the flesh. No, I, I, when I speak to people in our circles, I try to bring the balance and I always say to them, it's so easy and it flows over your lips so, so smoothly when you say, and it sounds so <laughs> authoritative <laughs> when you say, devil, I rebuke you. <laughs> yes. But when it comes with the things of the flesh, it's not easy to say that you, it doesn't flow that well to say, flesh, I crucify you. <laughs> yeah, <for sure. laughs> and so I think to find that balance is vitally important mm. to see that the Bible gives us both truths. Mm. That is incredible. And, and by the way, that's where we need discernment. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I think Spurgeon also said something which uh, also always stuck with me. He said, you know, the challenge of our day and age is not just to discern right from wrong, but to discern right from what is almost right, right. Um, which, which I really appreciate as well. Where do we start? What is the process of discernment? Where, where do we start with this? Uh, let, let me speak about the meaning of discernment first, okay. because then it can help us to, to identify the process. And this is a very basic, simple, unadorned definition of discernment. It's basically separating two things mm, mm. and examining them. I could add to make a decision yeah. eventually. So when we speak about biblical, spiritual discernment, it is to separate things with the purpose of examining them. Now, what do we separate? Good and evil, mm -hmm. error and truth, etc., etc. And then when we separate them, we examine them and we, we see where does God want us to be. And, and as I said, the center point of truth and of, of what good is. So for me, spiritual discernment is this, separating those things, investigating them, examining them, and then with the help of the Holy Spirit, going to the written word and see what does the Bible say about this. Mm. So, so I need to discover truth, first of all. I need to identify error. Uh, because if I, if for me, unquestioned morality is no morality. I need to question things. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's what Paul encourages us to do. He says, uh, and I know some people abuse that scripture where he says, uh, basically examine all things. Mm -hmm or test all things. Hold on to what is good. But let me say this. He doesn't say test or, <laughs> I think some people read it as taste all things. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> because they want to, they, but there are certain things written in the word. I don't have to test it. It's already been tested. God tells me. I don't have to go and uh, to find out is an extramarital affair wrong. I know what the Bible mm, says. Absolutely. So I'm not going to do any testing or tasting there. And, and then um, he says, and hold fast to what is good mm. and avoid even the appearance of, of evil. Mm. So here's, here's what I need to do. Identify what is r right, what is truth, what is good, and also identify the error. And mm. then 
stay as far away from error as possible, and then see if I can find the parallel truth mm. that I spoke about earlier. And, and then position myself if I see I'm leaning too far towards this truth or that truth, I need to position myself in the center of that. Um, a, a, a very interesting story that I read years ago in a magazine about somebody who was flying a light aircraft and crashed in the jungle somewhere in, in South America, far from civilization, mm. any town or city. Miraculously, he survived the crash. His uh, radio in the plane was destroyed. He had a few rations, etc., etc., and then decided, I will have to walk to safety. I will, nobody's going to find me here. And he started walking. And obviously he survived and they found him later, otherwise we would not have known his story. So what happened, he walked and walked for days, survived with the rations and obviously uh, some things in nature that he could eat and the water that he could drink. But <laughs> to his great shock, one day as he was walking, he arrived back at the crash site of his plane. <laughs> and he thought, I'm already kilometers away on the way to the, the next town. So. So it was interesting that there are different theories in this article about how come he arrived back at the crash site. Hmm. And the one theory which I think is, is quite plausible <laughs> is that this guy said that without you knowing it, if you walk on the street or on the pavement where there's a path, this does not apply. But if you walk somewhere where there's no path, they say that usually your one limb will be a dominant leg. And because it's dominant, maybe millimeters, but you take a bigger stride, say with your right leg, than your left leg. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you, if you have the time to go and, 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 and uh, practice that, you'll see that you eventually will land up walking in a circle. Mm. And here's the spiritual lesson that I learned from that. If we overemphasize one truth all the time and we ne neglect the parallel truth, mm. we're gonna walk in circles. Yeah, for sure. So <laughs> what is the solution here? Mm. What they say what he should have done is he should have given himself a beacon on the horizon and then walk to that beacon and then try to look back to where he came from and then found he had to find another beacon in line with that, and then he could uh, uh, walk in a straight line. And again, there's a spiritual lesson in that. The Bible gives us the beacons. Yeah, for sure. And we just need to make sure that we keep on looking unto Jesus, and we need to keep on following mm. what the Bible says. So where do we start with this uh, process of discernment? In the Bible, in the Word, the of, Word God. of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, a lot of people would say, but, but I had this experience about <laughs> the things of God. Does experience count for anything or should it always relate to what we see in the Word of God? Listen, we do, I think God's Word is there to be experienced. Mm. But my experience can never become the standard by which I live. I can never base doctrines on experience. Mm. Mm. Because, uh, uh, let me just put, this, put it this way. My senses, my natural s physical senses can trick me. Yeah, for sure. I remember when I was small, or smaller as I always say, <laughs> <laughs> when I was younger, I remember as a child <laughs> lying in my room and it was dark but I could still see and there was a coat hanging mm. behind the door. And you know, if you, <laughs> if you look at that coat for long enough, you actually see it moving and your senses, your eyes can trick you. So we should not make what we can sense or what we can experience our ultimate guide mm. because it can fool us, it can mm. deceive yeah. us. And there's one instrument that is absolutely reliable 
And that's the written word of God. And there is where we need to start. I like, I like uh, what I read about um, uh, people in, in the book of Acts. In Acts 17, I know the Bible wasn't written in chapters, but it's very interesting that it, these three things appear in the same chapter. In Acts mm. 17, we read first about um, the Jews in Thessalonica where Paul preached. And it says they, they absolutely rejected. They didn't want to listen to him. They argued with him. They actually uh, didn't want to accept his message. So they were absolutely inflexible. Mm. Then at the end of the chapter, Paul is in another city. He's in Rome. And this time his audience is um, gentle people, Gentile people. And so what did they do? <laughs> they met on the on the Areopagus and all that they did every day is they wanted to hear something new. So these guys never wanted to hear the Jews, never wanted to hear anything new. These guys only wanted to hear something that they've <laughs> never heard before. Inflexible, gullible, yeah. absolutely gullible. And I think that's, and again I speak about our constituency, they always want something new. Mm. And there's nothing new. I think you can, you can present things in a fresh way, but there's no new truth. Mm. But smack in the middle of Acts 17, Paul is in another city in Berea, and here this time his audience is believers. Mm. And it says they, and I'm, I'm not quoting it verbatim, it says they heartily and readily accepted the word of God that he preached but then went and searched the scriptures see if it was where there was her. Mm. So Thessalonica, the, the Jews, inflexible. Rome, the Gentiles, gullible. These guys, teachable. Mm. But the word of God played the major role here. And I think you've mentioned something. You said that sometimes a truth gets pushed to such an extent that it becomes an error. And I've seen this in churches. There's incredible pressure upon pastors and ministers to, to create unique experiences, you know, for people in their churches. And they will sometimes even take a good thing, like right. the work of the Holy Spirit, maybe right. pray uh, for the sick, um, you know, expelling demons, whatever. They'll take something good. And that is what the church almost becomes. Right. That is all that's going on in those churches. What would you say to pastors that, that find themselves in that incredible pressured situation where they have to now perform to keep their congregants? Where, where can they start? All right. I think it's so important to, to sit down and find out what is the mission of the church. Mm. Now, when I say find out, I'm not saying think up yeah, for sure. something because the mission of the church is already given to us in the Word of God. So, so if, we can, if we can find the balance again, because there are different aspects to the ministry of the church. There's first of all ministry unto the Lord. Mm. And we read about that in the book of Acts, how they, how they prayed, how they fasted, how they ministered unto the Lord, and then the Holy Spirit spoke. And if I can use examples, our, our prayers, our praise and worship, our obedience unto God, that's ministry unto the Lord. Mm. Then a second aspect of the ministry of the church is ministering to the believers, the flock, the, the, the local church. Um, or let me rather say the fold, because there are many folds in one flock. Mm. So, so ministering to these believers, edifying them, building them up, I think teaching them the word, training them, equipping them, that's, that's very important. Then thirdly, there is, I believe in the church, ministry to the flock, to other churches and maintaining a good relationship. Then there's ministry to the world, mm. uh, to the unsaved, reaching out to the poor, evangelizing, etc., etc. And And lastly, and I, 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 I am careful to say this, ministry unto Satan. We don't serve Satan. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> we serve a notice on him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but exercising our authority that God has given us, where the devil has 
kind of claimed territory for himself. Mm. And I do believe the church should have uh, uh, how should I put it? The church should be, the, as Jesus said, the salt of the earth, mm. the light of the world. And when we look at those uh, aspects of ministry, then we should be able to find a balance. And I think when we, when we preach especially, I need to ask myself, am I giving this congregation a balanced diet? Mm. Am I giving them uh, enough of, of both truths that are parallel? Mm. I'll, I'll never forget, I uh, spoke at a farmer's day in, in Colesburg. And uh, obviously they have marina sheep there. And I asked one of the farmers about this because I read about it. And, and he said, no, it's absolutely true. You can overgraze a particular field. And the grass gets so short that the sheep actually do not get the proper nourishment. And so they have different camps. Then, then they send the sheep in another camp so that they can eat there again. Because it's so easy for us to just focus on one truth. Healing is a truth. Mm. But if you only focus on that, deliverance is a truth. If you only focus on that, the grass gets so short and they, they do not get to eat. Uh, um, a balanced diet and I think that is so vital for us to, to, to say to ourselves okay I need to preach about the supernatural but I also uh, need to pr preach about how do I practically live my Christianity mm -hmm. because in one sense cr well let me say that Christianity is spiritual but I'll be honest with you I don't think it's mystical yeah, you're right. It's practical. Mm. Mm. So I need to, to find this balance between spiritual and practical. How do I live my Monday life from my Sunday word that I get? Mm. Mm. Yeah, for s absolutely. A and there seems to be an understanding that there's only certain individuals that are born of the gift of discernment. Um, I've heard a pastor say the following to me. He said to me, yes, but... When you look at 1 Corinthians 12, it's a gift to some, but not to others. You know, and I went, no, 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 the Bible teaches us that we all need to be discerning. Right. Um, and, and that's maybe the excuse that, that we sometimes hear in the Scriptures is, well, from the Scriptures is, no, 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 this is a gift. It's for an elect few, not for everyone. But that's simply not true. How do we get to a place where we become spiritually mature right. to determine right from wrong? Let me first of all start with what you said about uh, 1 Corinthians 12. I believe that there are three kinds of discernment. And we need to discern between three kinds of discernment. discernment. <laughs> the first kind of discernment I want to call natural discernment. Mm. Uh, there are other words for it. Common sense. Yeah. Horse sense. <laughs> Common sense is not always so common. Horse sense just means you're, <laughs> yeah. you're one step above a donkey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, common sense, we've all been given common sense, but we don't always use it in the right way. It's very interesting that Jesus, uh, I think Luke 16, where he speaks about the dishonest manager who mm. cooked the books because he knew he was going to lose his job. Then, surprisingly, Jesus commends him not for his dishonesty, but for his shrewdness, for his street wiseness, for his common sense. He mm. knew that he was going to lose his job. And Jesus says, sometimes these unbelievers have more common sense, and I'm using my own words yeah. here, than, than the children of God. So there is common sense, but common sense, in my opinion, could be corrupted. Mm -hmm. It could be abused like we see in, in that. So we need to recognize that there are two other kinds of, of discernment. And let me get to the 1 Corinthians 12 one. I want to call that supernatural discernment mm. because it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, in my opinion, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are available to, to everyone. It's not an exclusive thing. Okay, but I'll come back to, to that. Now, incidentally, it's the gift of the discerning of spirits which means that the Holy Spirit gives us supernatural insight to see 
when something is happening, is this demonic or is it heavenly? Yeah. Is this a demon spirit or is this the Holy Spirit? Because sure. sometimes, as we know, they are counterfeits. Yeah, for sure. So it helps it. Now, that sometimes people think that gift of discernment is, <laughs> and I've heard people say, I discern that you have a, a, a critical spirit. <laughs> yes. Uh, you see, mm. discernment is not suspicion. That mm. was suspicion. Yeah, that's not suspicion. The suspicion, suspicion is a product of the unrenewed mind. Mm. Discernment is a product of the renewed mind. Mm. So, then there's a third kind of uh, discernment, and that's actually what we're talking about right now. Mm, mm. Spiritual discernment. Natural, supernatural, and spiritual. Now, spiritual discernment is supernatural because it comes from God. Mm. But just for the sake of... Uh, of identifying between them. So that spiritual discernment, in my opinion, is both a gift and a skill. Mm. And it's very interesting if you read in, in uh, um, when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says to them that the things of the Spirit are only discerned by spiritual people. Mm. Mm. And then the author of Hebrews writes and he says, there are some people who cannot even discern between good and evil. Mm. He says they are the, and, and he's talking about believers. He says, yeah. but they are babies. Mm. They still feed on the milk of the word. He says, but the mature believers, now there's already a, a, a clue for us. He says, they who eat solid food mm. have developed their spiritual skills and they can discern better. Now, um, it's, it's so important to realize that discernment is not just between good and evil. Uh, I, I like what Paul writes and he says, uh, I, I pray for you that you may discern what is best. If you are still discerning between what is good and what is bad, you have some growing to do mm. because ultimately you need to move to what is best, what is good and what is best yeah, for sure. because what is good can sometimes be the worst enemy of what is best. Yeah. Right. And so, so here's what Paul writes uh, to the Corinthians and he speaks about, uh, I like to call them the ecos people, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, uh, the natural man, the uh, uh, spiritual man, and then he speaks about the carnal man. That's right. Yeah. So he uses these, uh, these Greek words, and, and, and in Greek it ends on, on ikos. Now, the natural man, we know, not born again, cannot discern the things of God because you don't discern it with mm. your natural mind or natural skills. Then he writes about the carnal man, born again, but still governed by the flesh, mm. the sarkikos. And if I can throw this in for anybody that can understand Afrikaans, sarkikos, how noch van farkikos. So they still like the things of the world and yeah, they're governed sure. by the flesh. Uh, they're born again. Mm. But mm. then he speaks about the pneumatikos, mm. the spiritual people that actually can uh, understand the things of the Spirit. Why? Because they're governed by the Holy Spirit. They spend time with the Word of God. <laughs> they are spiritually mature. And we need that spiritual maturity in order to be able to discern things properly. And you've also mentioned that, you know, the Word of God of, is of, of primacy. Uh, but we also need good common sense. Sometimes you don't need to go to the Word of God to, to see certain things for what it is. Right. Um, and you know, um, I've seen in the news media uh, recently um, a church congregation uh, took all of their savings and all of their life's, <laughs> right. you know, uh, savings and they gave it to the man of God to invest on their behalf and he lost everything. Right. That is an example of somebody that has no common sense and somebody that, that thought or tried to over-spiritualize just what should have been normal, good, common sense. Yeah. But, but Pastor, what do we do with pastors? you know, that belief, well, um, you know, I, I don't have time to, to sit down and discern all things or everything. And, 
And there are certain gray areas that sometimes creep into the church that, that the Bible does not emphatically speak on. How do we discern in gray areas what is right from wrong? Um, I, I always look at, at three levels of, of authority. Hmm. And, and before I speak about the three levels of authority, let me just say this, that I remember when we were at school, we were taught the, um, the degrees of comparison. If you say good, better, best, sweet, sweeter, sweetest. But I remember... Blue bills. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember our teacher saying to us that there are certain words that do not have a, a degree of comparison. Mm. Like dead. Yeah. Something is dead. It's There's dead. not deader and deadest. <laughs> Although when I look at some church mm. members, I think we can apply <laughs> yeah. that that guy's dead, that guy's it's deader. deader. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's deadest. <laughs> uh, mm. and, and the one thing that does not have degrees of comparison is true. Mm. True, you cannot say true, true were truest. or truest. Because if something is less true, it's not true, it's not true anymore. Mm. So it is important for us to, to, uh, to see that, that truth is truth. Mm. And if a pastor says that he does not have time to, to discern things, wow, I have a great issue with that. Mm. Because for us, we need to be leaders in, in discernment. Now, one of the meanings of the word discern, in fact, the Latin word where we get our English word from, means to separate and to serve. Mm, mm. And I do believe that the Bible is our sieve. The Bible, um, our worldview must be formed by our, our Bible. Everything we see must be, be uh, formed through the lenses of, of the Word. So, so if a pastor says to me, I don't have time to go to the Word and develop discernment, wow. You see, uh, 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 very interesting, Solomon, King Solomon, when he had the opportunity, and I wonder what we would have chosen if God gave us God blanche and said, you, you choose whatever you want to. And I know we, we normally think he chose wisdom, but actually if we identify it closely, we'll see that he chose discernment. Mm. What is interesting is King Solomon considers four things very important. And you, you see that right through his writings in the Proverbs, etc., etc. And these are the four things. Knowledge, understanding, discernment, and wisdom. And here, here is how we need to look at it. What is knowledge? Knowledge is when I receive the facts, when I receive the truth. Understanding is when I am able to interpret the truth. I'm going to skip over discernment and get to wisdom. Wisdom is when I apply the truth, when I live it. Mm. But what is discernment? We, I said it earlier. Uh, it's investigating, yeah, examining sure. the truth. And therefore, I think it's vital for us to, to go to the Word of God. And when you read in, in the book of Proverbs, and, and, and you, you'll find that, Solomon uses words like these, I cry out for discernment. I, I desire discernment. Mm. So I always put it this way. You need to learn and you need to yearn to discern. Yeah, for sure. That must be such a passion in our hearts. We must always desire that. And when God gave him that choice and said, choose whatever you want, the actual thing is he chose discernment. Mm. And, uh, and I think that shows how important it is. Every pastor should, if he gets a choice from God, should say, Lord, help me. Yeah. Give me, and, and, and we know that Solomon actually said, give me a heart with ears, a heart that can hear, mm. a heart that can, can uh, discern. And, and that's my desire, that when I read the Word of God, that I will have that heart that will be sensitive to the truth of God. Mm. That's amazing. And I think pastors don't have an excuse. They've got an obligation. 
um, especially for what they're going to feed their congregants. Right. Uh, but Pastor Mark, then in those gray, gray areas, what are some of the things that they can apply to, to oh, navigate yeah, yeah, some yeah. of those gray I, areas? I, I wanted to get to that. I, I spoke about the three levels of, or, of authority. Yes. Uh, let me call it this for the sake of the pastors. What the church should believe, how the church should behave, mm -hmm. and how the church should be run. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> now, when it comes to what the church should believe, that's uh, not optional. I have the written word of God. I cannot decide what to believe. I have to believe that Jesus is the Christ and all of those essential doctrines I have to, to believe. And so um, God and His Word, obviously, uh, they are the authority that should speak into my life. Then we get to how the church should behave. And it's very interesting that in, in Romans and in Corinthians, I think 1 Corinthians 10, right about there, Paul speaks about, and different translations use different phrases to describe it, doubtful matters, disputable matters, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, reasonable things. And, and let me use the term gray areas, mm -hmm. where actually something, there's no clear recipe in the Bible. Now, what is the authority there? Still God, yeah, for sure. still His Word. I cannot do anything that would contradict God's Word. So I, I, I don't have uh, um, uh, total freedom here to do my own thing. I still need to honor God and His Word. But there's a third thing that comes into play here, and that is my conscience mm -hmm. as a believer. And if you go and read about those gray areas, Paul speaks about conscience. And very interesting, he says, uh, he speaks about people with a weak conscience. He mm. says some uh, will eat meat and, and some do not. Yeah. And then he, he says to us, don't do things that will make those with a weak conscience stumble. And here's an interesting thing for me. <laughs> we always think that a strong conscience is a very strict mm. legalistic conscience. It's not. A weak conscience has not learned the freedom that I have, have yeah, for sure. yeah. in God's Word. So a strong conscience is somebody who's seen the Word, who's seen, okay, here's what God's Word says. Um, because I think sometimes we, we develop an extra strict, extra strong kind of religion. Yeah, for sure. And a strong conscience is a conscience full of the Word, knowing what the Word says, where my boundaries are, etc., etc. And then um, the, the, the third, so, so that comes to eating meat, drinking wine, Paul speaks about those mm. things, etc., etc. And uh, there my conscience plays a vital role, but I, I must never forget God's, God and His Word. Then the third area, how the church should be run. Still God, still His Word must speak there. My conscience, I cannot violate those primary authorities. But there's something else that comes into play here. I'll mention it now. Let me just say, in my opinion, I don't think there's any model for church government in the New Testament. It doesn't say you must have 12 elders and 7 deacons and, and whatever. There are principles, mm. but there's no uh, program or no model so, I almost want to say whatever works. So, here's the factor that comes in. Feasibility, mm. workability, whatever works. As long as it doesn't violate God, His Word, and my conscience. Mm. And therefore, I, I have a lot of uh, openness to churches. I go to different churches and they different liturgies. Mm. <laughs> And as long as the liturgy does not contradict God and His Word, they might not sing the same kind of songs, they might not use the same instruments, but listen, they worshiping God. Yeah, for sure. And how the church should be run concerning worship, liturgy, 
I don't think we should be that prescriptive. So every time we have a little bit more leeway. And that is what pastors need to, to realize. They need to know where the boundaries in the word would be for them. Yeah, and, and it means work. <laughs> right. It means they have to read. And right. Uh, it's not going to drift from heaven <laughs> and they're going to get this revelation, this extraordinary revelation. Right. Pastor Mark, wha- how would you encourage, uh, and maybe this is something, um, you know, a lot of people would ask us, is would, would I ever get to the age or would I ever get to the place of maturity uh, that, that I can discern all things, as Scripture says, or, or does it take a whole lifetime? I think it takes a lifetime. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you, you reach a point where there is enough spiritual maturity that you don't make obvious mistakes. Mm. But there are o- always pl- uh, 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 a place to, to learn yeah, for things sure. that I have to, to learn. So I don't think it ever ends. We never arrive. We never arrive. Uh, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, and, and maybe a, a buzzword that is out there often is, for you to be discerning, you have to place yourself under another man's authority. Right. What do you think of that teaching where, where people would say, for you to be discerning and to do the right thing, in all of these three aspects of ministry, you have to be under the direction of a set man right. or an individual. Right. Uh, let me say this again. I think balance is important here mm. because people are totally imbalanced in a lot of uh, areas here. There are people who will, whatever the set man or the leader says, they That's will law. follow. Yeah. yeah. And again, where's God? Where's His Word? I have mm. to make a decision. If anything, I don't, whatever structure of authority is, whether it's in the church, whether it's in society, or whether it's in the family, whatever violates God's Word, I have to make a decision. And that's what the, the disciples in the early days did. They actually said, we have to obey God more than we obey you. Mm, mm-hmm. So they had to make that choice and face the consequences. So we, we, we have to do that. And, and what is important here is to, is to um, hold on to the Word of God. And um, let me just hear your question again because I, I, I lost a bit of track. Yeah. Must they be under a... Oh, yes, 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 yes. Here's what I want to say. And I think Hebrews, the preamble to the book of Hebrews, for me, says it all. Because the author starts off and he says, and I'm quoting a not verbatim, he says, in days past, God spoke to us through the prophets. Uh, but then he qualifies and he, he basically says the, the revelation of the prophets was fragmented. It was not complete and fully. He says, but in these last days, he speaks to us through the Son, through Jesus Christ. Mm. I'm not saying that there is not a place for prophets in the New Testament because we read about that. I'm not saying that we should, should totally ignore it, but don't just listen to the prophets. Mm, very good. Go to the Word of God and ask yourself, does this line up with the Word of God? And I know I'm, I, I'm careful to th- say this because it threatens my job security. <laughs> don't, just be <laughs> don't just be taught by the teacher. Mm. Let God teach you. Again, in the book of Hebrews, he writes about the old covenant and the new covenant. And he says, in the new covenant, no one shall teach you. That doesn't mean there's no place for teachers Mm. in the body of Christ. What is he saying? Make sure that ultimately the Holy Spirit uh, is the one who teaches you because the anointing that is in you will teach you all things. But that doesn't mean totally ignore the teachers. The same thing with with human counselors. Mm. Don't just go to a, a spiritual counselor and follow their advice without, um, without checking it against the Word of God. Uh, I always say to people who are involved in, in, in counseling, don't give people answers. If you go and look at, at, at the life of Jesus on earth, how did He deal with people who came with questions? Quite often He asked them a counter question. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And he, because he wanted them to think. Mm. 
And then he, he would take them to the Word and he would say, what is your interpretation of this? And he, or we would teach them a parable so that they could think, t- think for themselves and mm-hmm. find the answer. And I think counselors should not be answer givers. They should point to the place where the answer could be found. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's the same with any other human being that thank God he gave those gifts to the church, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. But it doesn't mean I must become dependent on them. Mm. And I think what, what is important is to see the difference between the old and the new covenant. Yes. Because in the new covenant, those people are just um, instruments that God mm. uses. But in the new covenant, God moved the whole emphasis on my relationship with Jesus, not just with a seer or a prophet or, yeah, right. or, or, or some intermediary in the Old Testament. Jesus is now our high priest. Yeah. And I have, um, I have full access to Him. Mm. And, and, and there's the balance again. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Uh, again, you've just mentioned the place of the Holy Spirit and the word right. of the Holy Spirit. Um, in discernment, uh, how, can we, how can we discern when it's the Holy Spirit or when it's not? Um, and I know the Holy Spirit will never violate the voice of God or the Word of God, but, you know, um, h- how do we get to a place where we are familiar with what the Holy Spirit is yeah. discerning and saying? Uh, you know, if I can go back to the words of Jesus where He spoke about Himself as the Good Shepherd, and He says, My sheep know My voice. Mm. I think there is a, a place that you arrive at where you can recognize this is the Holy Spirit. And if you don't, here's what I always say. Uh, in Romans, Paul writes and he says, the sons of God, the mature sons of God, mm. are led by the Spirit of God. Mm. So when I face an issue, I use some of those scriptures. I, I say, God, I thank you that your word says that I'm a child of God, I'm a son of God, and I'm led by the Spirit of God. I have this inclination inside of me. It's not contrary to the word and I know that your word also says let the peace of God be the judge the the umpire Empire let it hearts. rule in your heart yeah, let, sure. let the umpire makes the final decision I quote those scriptures and I in my simplicity I say to God because I have this desire inside of me I'm going to take it as a green light mm. and I'm going to act on it because if we don't act on those promptings of the Spirit, on that little still small voice sometimes, mm. I think we are going to miss God somewhere. Yeah, sure. I would rather do something, obviously not something that is against the Word of God. I'll, mm. I'll follow a prompting and then ask God, if it's not supposed to be a green light, tu- change the color, let mm. it turn amber or, or red, because if something is in my heart and it's a good desire, I'm going to follow it. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I think that you need to, for your whole life, keep on doing that mm-hmm. and just act on the Word of God because it's better to do something and repent than to make the biggest mistake than that is to never do anything. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Pastor. Um, I want to just ask you, where can people reach you? Where can they get to your material? You've mentioned in the previous clip, but maybe you can quickly tell people if they need any further instruction where they can reach out to you. Maybe you can tell us. Yeah, very simply, we have a website and it's edify and uh, edify with an I at the end, edify.teachable.com. Uh, simply that edify.teachable.com That is fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for everything that you mulled through. Um, I think the listeners will really appreciate that. And thank you so much again for being here in the studio with us. Thank you. I really appreciate that.